It's time for the podcaster who's pretty sure Kubernetes is the name of an indie rock band I saw open for Built to Spill back in 1997. It's Vince, and I'm back with another podcast. This episode is the first in a series of interviews I conducted at the 2019 RSA Security Conference in San Francisco. My guest this episode is Austin-based hacker and entrepreneur Marcus Carey. We sat down to discuss Marcus's new book, Tribe of Hackers, and we also talked about how Marcus got into cybersecurity, his time in the military and at the NSA, his thoughts on Edward Snowden, Marcus's take on the evolution of the cybersecurity industry, Uh, what it's like raising a second-generation hacker, and other cybery, cyber-related cyber stuff. Oh, and we also did a little bit of MacGyvering to get this interview recorded at RSA. So you'll, you'll hear what I mean by that in a little bit. So with that, on with the show. Okay, RSA 2019. I'm here with Marcus Carey. Marcus is a cybersecurity researcher, hacker, and the founder and CEO of Threat Care. Marcus is also the author of a new book with Jennifer Jin entitled Tribe of Hackers, Cybersecurity Advice from the Best Hackers in the World, a collection of interviews with uh, 70 top hackers, which is now available on Amazon, right? Yep, and Kindle and uh, paperback. Cool which I have a paperback copy right here, and I've been enjoying it. Thanks for joining me, Marcus. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot for having me. I've been wanting to do this for a while, man, so I'm, I'm glad we finally got to do it. Yeah, we've been talking about this for a long time. Yeah. Thanks for having me. So how's RSA going so far for you? RSA's going pretty cool. Uh, we have our boots set up. We're, we're hustling. My team's down there trying to you know, meet as many people and as we can, and, and hopefully this will be a successful trip for us. Yeah, I remember running into you last year, and you were beaming about it last year. It was a really big success, so I'm sure it's going to be, especially with this book now, it's probably bringing more visibility. Yeah, I mean, blew my mind that people are coming to the booth with their books uh, yeah. and asking for uh, me to sign you know, my, my contribution. You're a celebrity now, man. How does that feel? Well, uh, my daughter has told me for a while now that uh, I'm famous to geeks. Yeah. So <laughs> you can take it as try it. But I'm I'm like a, such a geek and nerd myself, but uh, she likes to tell me that. But that's my tribe, right? Yeah. Before we get into the book, I just want to learn a little bit about your background and how you got into the cybersecurity industry. So, uh, yeah, so when I, I grew up in uh, a small town, uh, I, I tell people I was the poorest kid I knew growing up. Uh, I just happened to be pretty smart uh, and and can memorize stuff, and that led me to scoring well on my military entrance exam, uh, which led me to do cryptography in the U.S. Navy. I worked at NSA, did work at DIA and, and all kind of different government agencies, and so I uh, learned a lot by working uh, in the Navy and for the for the the government agencies. Uh, got out doing contracting, so my entry to tech and hacking was certainly working uh, for the government and working for NSA. What was it like working for NSA? It was pretty cool. Before I got to NSA, I had seen Enemy of the State. Okay. Which is like a paranoid view of NSA, kind of yeah. like traumatized. Yeah. So I was kind of paranoid. Uh, I was really worried uh, about it because I thought the security was going to be crazy high and all that stuff. Uh, ended up, uh, the Navy actually has more stringent security than NSA did at the time. And I, that's probably still the case. Yeah, so the Navy, way before Snowden was a big deal, the U.S. Navy had the most craziest espionage cases ever. The Navy is legendary <laughs> for people that have done crazy stuff like give cryptography to the Russians, give nuclear designs to the Russians. And so the U.S. Navy is at, actually had a history of the worst case breaches. And so what you saw is I saw the Navy was super really serious about security and and when i first got to nsa that wasn't the case being at the nsa was actually cake work by being in what i was called the naval security group Uh and that's actually a a part of nsa's 
uh, the NSA is a is, is collection of civilians and the military. The military piece is the CSS on NSA CSS. Uh-huh. So the military. Wait, what does CSS stand for? A uh, Central Security Service, I okay. believe. Right, and so the Navy was way more stringent on security than uh, it was at NSA. Okay, so we had to abruptly end the interview. Not end it, but put it on pause because we got kicked out of the room that we were in and we've relocated. What did we just do, Marcus? So uh, what we did is we snuck down the hallway here. Um, we, we looked around and we found an abandoned room, uh, set up the podcast equipment. Uh, Vince's podcast rig is impressive. Uh, we we have two mics, a mixer, all kind of stuff here. Uh, we just uh, commandeered our open room here at RSA, uh, and we're recording a true hacker fashion here. I can't believe it. This guy's a hacker. I, I, I'm a kindred spirit with the hackers for sure. Uh, oh, and also big ups to the AV team next door who pointed us out to this room. So uh, anyways, let's get back to the interview. What do you think about Edward Snowden? You mentioned him earlier, but what are your thoughts on him? Everybody that I know that knows anything about Snowden, and I mean people outside the agency and people that's even in the agency still, think Snowden is a joke. He wasn't a top-level hacker or any of the stuff that some people think he is. He obviously is a really smart guy. I think he has a high IQ and all that stuff, but... uh he wasn't some top-level U.S. operative or anything like that. And I think that I think the press and, and even him, himself, uh, kind of misinterpreted or just didn't know what they were talking about when it comes to, you know, what NSA does and, and all that stuff. Uh, so that's, how, that's what I think about Snowden. I, I can tell you for sure that most people that work at the agency don't care about your life or what's going on in your life and don't care about listening to you. Uh, there's bad apples everywhere, but, and Snowden was a bad apple, by the way. He actually endangered a lot of people. He endangered our troops. He endangered collection methods. So uh, I'm cool with the privacy advocates and saying that he exposed something, but, I mean, nothing's really changed, though, if you, if you, look, at, if you look at anything. So I think he's heralded as being some kind of hero. I think that what he did was... Um, there wasn't hero status stuff to me. So that's how, that's what I think about Snowden. Cool. Oh, and the other thing is, have you heard about this NSA reverse engineering tool that they're going to release here at RSA? Have you heard about that? Yeah, I heard about it. Um, I think it's awesome that NSA is participating in the community. Usually, uh, it's funny, when I go to a conference, I see different things than everybody else sees. I know a lot of people at the conferences belong to some agency. I've worked with some of these people and they tell me because they know me because of my background, they'll share with me in confidence. Hey, yeah, cool. I'm at such and such and such and such. So uh, they are always out here in the community. But what I see sometimes is uh, uh, what I like about this tool is that it's not just a one way in. Like basically they go to hacker conferences, hear hackers talk, and they're, they're using that stuff uh, for 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 their mission so it's great that nsa is actually starting to put stuff back into the community yeah that's that's it right on and this is probably more of like a defensive tool right well i think it when any tool any tool tool could be used for offense or defense reverse engineering could help you find bugs so you can patch them or you can find that bug and it could be used for an offensive capability so anything in cybersecurity to me could be an off, offensive or defensive tool pretty much for the for the most part, so I, I view it as a weapon. It's a it, it's a it's a tool, should I say? And you can use it for offensive or defensive capabilities. I think it's great that the NSA is releasing tools too, because before we were just getting it from what WikiLeaks and Snowden. I think they're getting out in front of the head of the curve. They're like, this stuff's getting out there anyway. You know, let's just beat them to the punch, right? <laughs> You're funny, man. <laughs> Yeah, so this is this would ne- this is definitely not the kind of stuff that that you're referring to, and you'll never hear me commenting on any tools that the agency has leaked and stuff. Uh, but uh, this tool is a, is a great tool, and, and like I said, it's a really good step in the right direction. Funny enough, people do think when they think of NSA, they think of 
the listening and the, the they're just hacking stuff and all that stuff. But the true mission, the original mission of NSA is to defend U.S. communications. Uh, and I'm talking about from a military standpoint and from an international espionage standpoint, defend against China, Russia, and all these different things. That's actually NSA's core mission. That's the real, real core mission of NSA. All right, let's talk about uh, Tribe of Hackers. It's a, a collection of interviews with 70 hackers. How did this project come about? So in the book, even, I, I talk about this a little bit. The people that know me know there's a couple of things about me. One of the things is I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm trying to build a company, and I'm a hacker. That's the kind of things that people will describe me as. So I've been following a couple of people, Gary Vaynerchuk uh, and Tim Ferriss, for a long time because they write a lot and they share a lot of information about entrepreneur, uh, you know, that, that struggle, you know, trying to be an entrepreneur and what, what you have to do. And they write a lot of books. Both have four or five books, probably, on how do you, how can you be successful. Tim Ferriss released a book called Tribe of Mentors. In that book, he actually, his network is ridiculous. He, you know, he interviews celebrities and all that stuff on. He has a podcast. And so he actually took uh, those celebrities and all those people that he know, and some of these people are business icons and actors and all that. He took them and he, he, he asked them questions the same way. And I was like, man, like, you know, when you go to a hacker conference and, you know, you go to a lot of these things and, you know, we call it hallway con where you're in the hallway and you asking questions. Well, how did you get into hacking? What was your first blah, blah, blah. So that's that's how I met you. Yeah. It wasn't in the hallway, though. It I was met, on the street. The I street. passed you on the street right. uh, at right. RSA last year and struck up a conversation with you. That's right. Yeah. And, and that same dialogue, like, how did you do this? Boom, 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 boom. So I was like, man. This is a great concept for a book because, and another thing is like Tim Ferriss has access to all those people. And as you see in the book, I have access to some pretty awesome people. And I just want to share that. So I have this morbid thing about me that uh, I just want to share everything I know, everything I learned, my network. I want to share everything before I'm gone. And so you'll definitely see more books from uh, me trying to put together more books me working with my friends, like you see in this book, uh, me writing other stuff about things that I've learned and how to hack life. Okay, I'm curious. Why did you pick 70? Because I think it should have been 1,337 people. Leet, right? Yeah, yeah. Why not leet? I think that was a missed opportunity. Well, I, th- I think that uh, that's actually a goal that we can set up right now, Vince, so basically, we have a couple more books that we're going to be doing. So, so like Tribe of Hackers, Volume Two, Volume Three. You know, you could get up to one thousand three hundred thirty-seven if you did nineteen editions of Tribe of Hackers. That's something to shoot for. Okay, we're going to do nineteen editions of Tribe of Hackers. But in all seriousness, we're about to release a couple of more books. We're going to be doing. Uh, it's going to be a series. It's going to be like Chicken Soup for the Hacker Soul. Why these 70 people? Um, was there sort of a, a pecking order of people that, that you wanted to reach out to? Or what was your thought process in, in, in reaching out to these particular people? First of all, I'm, I'm actually surprised that anybody participated in the book. I'm like, wow, people really. But I think that the main driver for the book was also to do a charitable work. So we donate uh, all, the, all the profits from this book. Actually, everything from this book, anything we get from Amazon, is, it goes to charity. So that's actually one of the things. The hacker community has a huge heart. I think that's why the book's so successful. The book is good, but it also has a charitable aim. Uh, so basically, we kept on asking people. Uh, we also, one of the goals of the book was to have this book to have uh, to be inclusive as well and to have, you know, above average, uh, you know, contributions from different, you know, different, you know, kind of people. And so that, that actually worked out pretty well, too. We have, a, you know, tons of women in the book, tons of minorities in the book, ton people internationally in the book. Oh, yeah, big so cross-section it's, it's of amazing. people, for yeah. sure. So, uh, yeah, and a lot of people, like, you know, I've, I was familiar with maybe a dozen or so people, but you introduced me to a lot of folks I didn't even know about before. And, uh, and I found, I, you know, now I have... I have a I have a target list of like seventy well not I've of a sixty nine more people 
that I can interview now because because of your book. Although I've already done Rob Graham twice, so I guess it's sixty eight. That's, that's my dude. Shout out to Rob. Um, oh, I love some of Rob's Rob's quotes too. Um, so so it was fourteen questions. Uh, the questions were. Is there one myth that you could debunk in cybersecurity? What is one of the biggest bang for the buck actions that an organization can take to improve their cybersecurity posture? What is it that cybersecurity spending is increasing by, wait, how is it that cybersecurity spending is increasing but breaches are, be, are still happening? Why do you need a college degree or certification to be a cybersecurity professional? It goes on and on and on. One of my favorites is what's your hacker, favorite hacker movie? Uh, which, of course, the top three responses were hackers, sneakers, and war games. I was expecting, I was actually expecting more people to say those, though. But you got a lot of responses uh, with other movies. Um, so I did a, I, I, I went down and like tallied all of them. And of all the, the answers that weren't hackers, sneakers, or war games, the most mentioned was The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Swedish version, of course. Which I've seen, and it's a fantastic movie. It's great. I haven't seen the David Fincher version, though. I'd like to see that, too. Like it's, he's, he's a good filmmaker. I, I'm sure his version's probably cool, too. Yes. Why so is, I, it, why is yeah. that your favorite hacker movie? It's my favorite hacker movie because I think that it was so well balanced with a great story, great, great lead character. I uh, love the fact that it was a badass woman hacker, too. Um, and... It was the most realistic portrayal of hacking, in my opinion, where it was subtle, like the subtle nuances of how, what I would do kind of situation. And I think that that's probably been, you know, adding all those things together because it wasn't about exaggerating, like totally exaggerated hacker claims, but it just went in with the story. And that, yeah. that's what that's why I think that's my favorite. Yeah, yeah. I, I like to I, – I went, in fact um, – Prior, getting ready for this interview, I went back and watched it again, and I, I fell in love with it all over again. It's it's pretty it's a pretty cool film. Anybody listening, if you haven't seen the girl with the dragon tattoo, Swedish version, of course, because the books were were written by a Swedish guy. It's a Swedish story, so obviously the Swedish version is a little more authentic. Yeah, and and what I really like about that uh, is that people have been even tweeting at me and are watching other movies that other people mention. So I think it's a great, really good reference for other people to get into. And and sometimes when people, I go back and watch movies all the time. Like if something in popular culture, I'll go I'll go look at it to see what the heck people are talking about. But that's a great list, though. Yeah, there's some in here that I kind of question a little bit, though. Like uh, Caddyshack, <laughs> Brandon Perry said Caddyshack, greatest hacker movie of all time. And uh, shout out to Brandon Perry. <laughs> uh, he, he's a funny guy. I, I liked some of his responses too. But I'll have to go back and, and watch Caddyshack with from like a hacker perspective because he had an interesting explanation for it. And I don't want to give it away. I want people to people should read it. A couple other movies that people suggested were weren't even hacker movies like. Catch Me If You Can, Black Klansman, The Saint, where it was more social engineering. Now, if that qualifies as a hacker movie, then Fletch is the greatest hacker movie of all time. Have you ever seen? You've seen Fletch, right? I remember, I remember Fletch, yeah. Chevy Chase, he plays the investigative reporter, and he's got a different alias, a different pretext, a different name in like every scene. Oh, he, what was he? He, posed, he, he tries to get into a, a hospital to get to doctor's records, and he poses as a doctor. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry, your name, doctor? Uh, Dr. Rosen. And then, then a minute later, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Uh, Dr. Rosen Rosen. You know, and like, what was that, doctor? Dr. Rosen penis? You know, and then he's... <laughs> And then he's and then another scene. He's like, "Hi, Harry S. Truman. Nice to meet you." Or, uh, "Hi, uh, G. Gordon Liddy. Nice to meet you." And you know, he he poses as a. I got to go back and watch it. But there's like yeah. a scene where he he uh, he basically carjacks uh, some kid's car, but says he's he's an emergency driving instructor and he's got to give him an on the spot test. <laughs> Uh, he poses as a mat a mattress <laughs> inspector. If anybody hasn't seen Fletch. Kids, you millennials out there, watch Fletch from an SE perspective. You'll 
freaking pee your pants. It's great. Yeah, I agree, man. Golly, I forgot about that movie. Did anybody mention that movie? No, no, no. But but you know what? Uh, people mentioned a lot of movies, though. Like, there's a lot of stuff in here. Uh, Ocean's 8, Ghost in the Shell. Uh, Rob Graham, of course, has to throw in some esoteric reference. Hot Millions, some old movie that nobody was alive for, except for maybe Rob. Um <laughs> Oh, Lindsay uh, Carhart, is that her name? Yeah, no, uh, hacker number nine. She said the KGB, the computer, and me, which I think is a cool movie. It's kind of dated, but um, other movies in here. Tron. Uh, oh, one, one movie that got a lot of mention was Swordfish, which I saw that in the theater. I don't even remember that being a hacker movie. I just remember that movie being referred to as Sword Tits because that's the movie that Holly Berry shows her boobs in. Like, that's all I remember from that movie. Well, I think that that was what the movie was advertised as, too. Yeah. So yeah. I'm going to go back for educational purposes and revisit that movie and look at it from a hacker perspective. But, yeah, I got a big kick out of this. And there's definitely some, some movies in here that I'm going to have to check out thanks to your book. That was, a good, that was a good question to put in there. So are there any people who surprised you with their answers to these questions? Like somebody that you're like, hmm, I didn't think that they would come up with that answer were there any 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 moments like that in the book uh the cool thing about the book some of the people are very concise um and some of them are um or not not i mean or not so concise Maybe ben donnelly for example ben went, went all in. out he went he went in. hacker number 22 by the way i ben, love it ben donnelly yeah love it so yeah so ben that was actually that was actually surprising and funny enough people I've been asked, well, how did I pick the hacker? You know, how did I pick in the book? He asked if he could participate on Twitter because I was already blogging about, hey, we're doing this book. He said, man, I would love to be in the book. And he, and he sent us, he sent us his, his content. I said, yeah, cool, come on. And so there was never this thing about even, like, keeping people out. And matter of fact, we asked over 100 and something people to participate in the book, and some couldn't for whatever reason. And I asked some people that that you would all know, you know, and and uh, I, you know, I, I did. I forgot to ask some people, and so overall, the project turned out fantastic. Um, and people, I asked people, and they they checked their DMs for me from a year ago, and I was asking them to participate, and they like, man, I missed it. But um, but there's going to be more books. Now. Volume two, they can make volume two. Um, so okay, I have to ask now. This is billed as cybersecurity advice from the best hackers in the world and they're numbered and you are number one does that mean i'm talking to the number one best hacker in the world no but there's a lot of people that claim that they're the best hackers in the world <laughs> i guess so, what i'm getting at was there any rhyme or reason to the to the ordering the numbering no no so everybody in there is alphabetical order i believe by their last name Oh, okay. So I didn't even notice that. Did you make sure not to interview anybody with an A or a B last name? We have we have a couple of people in there that may have been in front of me. I think I would have been number three if I was alphabetical. Uh -huh. So how this all works is I, I read Tim Ferriss's book. I was like, I want to write a book. I wrote all the first questions. I wrote the beginning. I wrote my questions, and I wrote the answers. And that's what all the people that wanted to participate in the book got. So that's like a relic. That was the that's what started the book, and then I emailed that 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 thing out to everybody, and then everybody that participated is in alphabetical order after me. Wow, I was searching way too hard for for meaning behind the numbers, because I was like, okay, who's the best hacker? It can't be Marcus. That it's too obvious. It's too obvious to put the number one person as the best hacker. So I was like, okay, there's got to be some code in here that reveals it. And I thought, okay, numbers, numbers, okay. Who's the goat? Michael Jordan's the goat. <laughs> so maybe twenty three. Kim, Kim Kimber Doset. <laughs> maybe <it>. she maybe <laughs> she's the goat hacker. But then I remembered, oh, you know, LeBron James is number twenty three too, and he's not the goat. <laughs> so number thirty. <laughs> so uh, so that I shot that down, and then I was, and then I started doing stuff like, okay, the best hacker is the most elite hacker, right? One three three seven. So, hacker number one three thirteen is Jim Christie. Well, that's actually some people would consider that guy, and you know Jim Christie's history. <laughs> no, no, he's actually kind of a big deal. 
but so it, but it couldn't be him because that would just be Lee. That would just well, be Lee, I'm, right? No, no, I'm telling you, man. Like that dude is a beast. It's, there's several people in this book. It, there's a lot of bo- people in this book on accident that worked at NSA and all these different agencies. So Jim Christie is actually public about what he did, and he actually, uh, if I get the story right, the Cuckoo's Egg, that book that everybody talks about, he's actually the guy, the the the. He's the law enforcement person in that book, supposedly. Oh, wow. Cool. So one of the biggest hacker novels or stories ever, he's actually the law enforcement agent that catches the hackers. That's him. I mean, we have people that have made a lot of money in, in the hacking thing, like Doug Song's in the book. Mm-hmm. You know, he sold his company for $2.3 billion. Doug uh, Song's got some great quotes, too. Doug Song, epic. About the meaning of life. He kills it. Uh, he says, if you're a good person and do right by the, by others the universe won't let you starve i don't know if that's his his quote necessarily but it's a good one um, yeah so doug's dad was a, a monk so he his dad like laced him up on all kind of game so doug and that dude doug man is the one of the most humble people you ever going to meet in your life and so it's it's awesome that i know these people and i'm and i and i actually help them and i think that my my bit at the beginning i'm really transparent you follow me online Mm -hmm. my answers were like super kind of like was transparent and they everybody saw my answers as an example and then a lot of people got really deep like that and i think that's what made the book work okay so my other my other thought was like okay so the numbers are on the sides of the pages right so if you put you kind of like put it like that there you got elite (laughs) <laughs> 13 and 37 Robert Lee is 37 but look Lee Robert Lee wow. 37 leet oh my leet. goodness well wow. so he's so I was like okay that's the most leet hacker in the book and he is pretty freaking leet dude I mean, his backstory is pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Um, so I'm sure you sp- you've spent tons of time with this. Do you have all the numbers corresponding to people memorized? Like if I quizzed you right now, could oh, you no. tell me? I, I don't know. I know. I, I, know, I know a couple like, people. Uh, like, who's hacker number 40? I don't know. Andy Malone. <laughs> uh, okay, let's go with... Uh, okay. I love this guy. Vince is hilarious, people. Y'all got it. If y'all don't have a chance to meet this guy, he, he is so awesome. Um, okay, hacker number 35. I don't know. I don't Marina Crotofil? Crotofil? How do you spell that? Say that. I would say Crotofil. 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 Marina Crotofil. Yeah. Okay. Hacker number 33. Did you just say this? No. Golly. I don't know. Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Kareem Abdul Jabbar. No, I'm just kidding. It's the Kareem <laughs> Abdul Jabbar of hacking. Dave, Dave Kennedy. Dave Kennedy is the Kareem. You're the GOAT. Scott Hook. Dave Kennedy is six foot four. According to his later latest one of his latest Twitter, posts. yeah, he balls too. I want I want to I want to play that guy. I want to I want to. I think we should organize like a pickup game at Hacker Summer Camp. He's a Cleveland Cavalier fan. Yeah, I know. So it sucks to be him. <laughs> anyway, I think this book has been a this book's been a lot of fun for me. I've found tons of quotes for, in here that that have been really inspiring, really uh, informative. You know, there's people in here that I didn't know exist. Um, and and now they're on my radar, so I'm gonna I'm gonna be um, uh, on the lookout for these people. Um, there is one thing on here at the end that I have a little bit of issue with. In your um, final thoughts section, you talk about staying in touch, and you say your last piece of advice is get on Twitter. And I think that's a catastrophe waiting to happen. Twitter is a freaking dumpster fire. It's a cesspool. There's so much freaking drama on there. Don't get on Twitter, kids. Don't listen to... I don't care if it's the number one hacker in the world who wrote the book on uh, on the best hackers. He's wrong. And I will even quote somebody in the book who is also one of the uh, top 70 hackers, (laughs) Robert Graham. This is Robert Graham's quote. Social media is a cancer. You like repeat memes because you agree with them, not because you've critically evaluated their veracity worth. Look before you repeat. Yeah. yeah. But, okay, in all seriousness, why do you give that advice? Why do you think people should, should get on Twitter? 
that are that are interested in infosec i I think uh, it's a great resource for anyone in cybersecurity. I've even had a lot of opportunities from Twitter myself. Uh, my first investment uh, was a fifty thousand dollar investment. I met that opportunity on Twitter. And there's a lot of different examples that I can use just like that. Yeah. I wouldn't know you if it weren't for Twitter. Yeah. I wouldn't know half the people I know in, in the hacker and, and no. uh, security community if it weren't for Twitter. No. But the thing that bothers me is there's so much fucking drama, dude. Like, yeah. How do we get rid of all this drama? How, I mean, everybody's, these, these people are supposed to be on the same team. And I see so much infighting, you know? Yeah. I, I, and I definitely have participated in drama on Twitter, no doubt. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, we all but, have. It's, it's I, hard not to. But I think that, like... I've actually matured a lot personally in the last couple of years, and I, and I noticed that, you know, that old saying is kind of it's kind of cheesy, like be the change you want to be. So like I think this book is kind of like that thing, and so there's been a lot of drama in the last year. That whole last year, I was in, I was we was working on this book, right? And what's crazy about that book is that there's people in that book that hate each other. Yeah. Yeah. I believe There's it. people in this book that have been beefing with each other. I've had people say, I hope so and so's not in that book. Mm-hmm. So um, It's inevitable. It's yeah. inevitable. You yeah. put yeah, you put seventy hackers in a room yeah. and uh, at least twelve of them are gonna hate each other. But and when you look at but when you collectively read that book, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, you have a wide spectrum of personalities and viewpoints and I think I think you did a great job of curating this. Um I'm curious about the cover. Uh, this is obviously, the cover art is obviously a reference to uh, Michelangelo's uh, creation of Adam from the Sistine Chapel. And it's a, it's a close-up of what is God's hand touching what would be Adam's hand, but instead of Adam's hand, it's like a robotic hand. Maybe it's the hand of, the robotic hand of Luke Skywalker. I don't know. <laughs> but what, what was the idea behind this and, and who created this, this, uh, this artwork? All right, so uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Michelangelo, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, and all those people. Man, there's so much crazy stuff going on in my head, and I'll just tell you everything about it. Like, what's crazy about that that picture? Uh, basically, and I was raised, I was raised religious too. Like, I'm, I'm from the deep south. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of stuff about that picture that's kind of funny. You're, you're, like you said, the hand of God creating creating man. Uh, I think that that. Uh, in the hacker community and definitely in the IT, the system administrator is God, right? He's the admin, right? And so the whole thing of hackers is hackers want root, right? So they're they're God, right? And so on the right side is the hacker in in, in this interpretation, and uh, the this this uh, robot, this arm over here is a is is man's creation. Man creates technology, and so that's what that that's what that means. Uh, but I could get real deeper than that. But I, I no, that, I, that, that's that's yeah, a, but that's good, a good answer. Good answer. Yeah, that's cool. Um, speaking of creation, your son is following in your footsteps, right? He's 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 a hacker. Tell me about what it's like to have a, a second generation of hackers in your family. Like how did how did that come about? Did he did you push him towards that? Was he inspired by you and decided to get into what dad's doing? Like how did that happen? Man, that's a good question, man. Uh, I, I told you, poorest person growing up, didn't have access to technology. But my son, he's been exposed to technology ever since he was a kid. And so the the benefit that he has is he's always had computers. My son had the first iPhone when he was like 11. It had every iPhone. Every time an iPhone dropped, my son got it. My son started hacking iPhones when he was like in... It must have been an early grade. I don't even know. He was hacking all his friends' iPod, jailbreaking them, all that, you know, you know, all that stuff. And so that's where he started. So he started learning how to code a little bit, uh, playing around with stuff. So he, he ended up, uh, my son ended up uh, writing when he was about 15, 16. He had like five or six iPhone apps in the iPhone store. Uh, he wanted to be a game designer. And so he, he learned code and and back then, it was hard to write iPhone apps. Now it's all kind of easier ways to do it. So he's just talented in that. And um, what, what my kids and, and whatever they whatever they had talent in, I always, always supported them 
So I got them an Apple Dev license. I would go to the dang bookstore to get a new Apple Dev book. Sit down with him. I actually did a lot of the UX stuff for him because I'm actually artistic as well. I did all the UX design for him. And he did all, coded all the back end stuff. So my son, funny enough, he was he wrote the first uh, iPhone app for Shodan back in the day. And and so he worked with John uh, Matherly, who who's the who's the founder of Shodan, and he wrote the first. He, he used the Shodan API and did all kind of cool stuff on our. You can look you can look that up. Uh, my son also wrote a a, a Metasploit interface for uh, an iPhone where you could interact with the Metasploit API when he was 16 years old. Wow! And uh, so we, I live in Austin, and so my son, uh, we have this thing called Aha in Austin. And and like all the all the top hackers in Austin come to this this thing. It's once a month, the last Thursday of every month. And my son would even get up there and, and present in front of all these famous hackers, you know, H. D. Moore, people in his book. And he would go up there. Cool, I wrote this Metasploit thing with my iPhone. Boom, like and and so Rapid Seven hired my son. Holy cow! Uh, and so my son has been working for Rapid Seven since. And he's he like 17. sixteen. Well, they they gave him an internship. Uh huh. For his junior year in high school. Uh huh. Seventeen, he did another internship for the summer, and he's like, I don't want to go to college. Wow. And so Rapid Seven hired him full time with a good salary. Wow. Like he was making a lot of money for his age. That's awesome. Uh, so he's seventeen, working full time for them. He's been working for them about five years now. So now he he has his own team. He's a senior software engineer for Rapid Seven now. Still, he's been working for them forever. Shout out to Rapid Seven. Thanks for, you know, taking a chance, with my son. That's great, man. I'll have to come out to Austin and, and catch up with you and your son. There's actually another father son hacker duo that I've met f- and interviewed from Austin. Are you familiar with Ruben and Manu Paul? Yep, yep. I know them from way back in the day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I interviewed them. At one of my f- one of my first podcasts was was with both of them, and I think that's great that there's you're seeing these you know, next generation hackers, you know, coming, coming through. It's like basketball, man. Like you're, you're Del Curry and, and your son's Steph Curry now, you know? That's right. And so Mano, uh, me and Mano were pretty cool back in the day. And I actually helped him start his son off actually. So yeah. Austin's a pretty tight community. Yeah. I need to come out there and, and check it out, man. And you're going to do uh, an event for Tribe of Hackers in Austin, right? That's correct. So, uh, yeah, thanks for letting me let me plug that. May 2nd, mark your calendars. We're going to have a Tribe of Hackers Summit, and we're going to be featuring speakers from the book. It's going to be TED-style talks. Uh, they're going to be limited to 18, 18 to 20 minutes per talk. Uh, so it's going to be a different kind of conference. Uh, we're doing, we're doing like, high-quality production. Uh, we're going to be putting all this media out. Uh, we're trying to inspire people to to join the industry. I think that people complain about you know, and, and they make numbers up sometimes. How there's a shortage of cybersecurity jobs, and so my my efforts are to educate people through books and stuff like that, uh, to build good software and, and build a, a su- successful company that can help me do stuff like this. And uh, that's the only way we're going to beat beat it is if we collaborate and we're. And we're kind of like on team. There's people in the book that are competitors of mine. They, they're, they're, you know, from a from a business perspective. But I, I think we're all on the same team. Uh, there's competitors in the book, but I think we do have a chance to leave behind a legacy, including our kids and including all the other people that we can influence. Yeah, and I think competition breeds innovation. It, I think it's good. I think competition's great, and and I think it's great that that you've included competitors in here I, I think you can have healthy competition in any field any industry so wrapping up here a uh, question i like to ask people what is your biggest pet peeve with the cybersecurity industry uh, my biggest pet peeve is uh with, with vars I, with what I, vars value-added resellers i think that there's a group of people out there and these are the vars in some cases they're trying to pick the winners and they're picking people that are good for their bottom line and then you end up with what uh, companies can only have a smaller product offering sets to try to secure their network. It's like radio has payola, right? You know, where people can pay. Yep. Pay so, to play. Yeah. So the bigger companies can actually essentially kind of like pay to play uh, and incentivize people to resell their products. And so what you end up doing is you, 
you if you're the right company you you have the right financial backers you know investors uh you can pay to play uh, say if you have the same investors as uh avar because there are investors that invest in those and so it's kind of like an incestuous relationship so if you're competing if you want to compete it's unfair but that's how business is though so you know you just got to recognize what the game is and then you got to find a way around it but that that right there uh, that actually is very irritating especially from a to, from a small startup perspective uh, that people can pay to play and and people don't you know they can pay to play by a number of ways they can sponsor stuff they can do all kind of stuff in order to keep in front of people and some of the people that are paying to play their 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 stuff is garbage so that's what my biggest pet peeve about cybersecurity is. Okay, and on the opposite side of that, what's something that you really like about the cybersecurity? What gives you hope? What inspires you? What's what's one thing that, that, that you really like about it? I really like the fact that the actual practitioners in a cybersecurity community, so I, I actually separate all this stuff. There's a community, that, there's an industry. I think those are two different things. So, uh, so I, I hate that... You know, the first thing I said is I hate that piece about that's the industry piece, right? Uh, so the the community piece, I like the fact that people will share information and mentor people and all these different things because with that, we're, we're building the next generation. And like people exaggerate stuff sometimes, but certainly we're going to have to be able to protect uh, our country from a cyber-related stuff because everything's computers, man. You know, whether some company inflating that, that concern or not, our kids going to have to be good at computers. They're going to have to be good at computers for cyber defense and for building products. If the new world is building software and all that stuff, and which it is, the Indians, the Russians, the Chinese, they really about this education. They really about engineering in order to compete in a global world. And this is from an American perspective. But we're going to have to share information we're going to have to teach each other, and we're going to have to push for our kids to be really good at this new technical world. And I see that happen in cybersecurity a lot. Um, five years from now, how, how do you think the cybersecurity landscape is going to look like? How is it going to be different than it is now? So I think uh, five years from now, I think that everything is going to be some kind of managed service. Like what? Like give me an, an example. So I can picture Google and Microsoft, uh, everything being in the cloud. And I think that those those two companies, Microsoft and Google, Apple will probably try to make a play. But I think that everything's moving to the cloud. It's like back in the day there was mainframes. I think we're moving back to the era. All right. Uh, and I think that everything's going to be managed uh, by them. They're going to be big players in the security space. Heck, you go down to the comp- you go down to the floor now. Microsoft has a big booth. I don't, Google has a big a presence here too because they're announcing one of the the uh, Alphabet companies uh, offshoots is is just just announced that they're public now. I mean they're they're uh, they're out of stealth, quote unquote. So what I see is I see Google and Microsoft right now. They there's Google Suite, there's Office 365. I think Apple will have to make a play in that arena. Apple does have competing desktop applications. I, I assume that they're going to have to move to the cloud too. But what's going to happen is those major companies are going to be have a bigger stake in cybersecurity. When Google was Google proper, they bought a virus total. Uh, Microsoft is buying security companies. Microsoft is, is all is all about security, security, security. They just they just got alien vault, right? Well, oh, that's AT&T. That's AT&T. AT&T. That's AT&T. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, but, I, but, I remember that because I saw your tweet, RIP, uh, alien, alien vault. vault. Yeah. yeah, so that's another co- consolidation play. So I think that stuff is being uh, consolidated into some kind of streamlined managed service type thing so there's all the big people are going to get into the game um and since they push everything out to the cloud a lot of these traditional enterprise solutions are not uh, going to work you know so i can imagine there won't be a real re- reason to do antivirus anymore stuff like that and so uh there, there's not going to be network dlp essentially because everything's in the cloud there might be cloud-based dlp but the Googles and the Microsoft Azure and all that stuff. So the security companies are going to have to pivot and have to be able to defend the cloud infrastructure. So that's the big difference. I think that uh, the cloud is consuming everything, whether, you know, the cloud somebody else's computer, 
but everything's going to be different uh, in five years. And then one last question here. When do you think the robots are going to take over? I don't think robots ever take over. <laughs> I tell people that like uh, any developer, anybody that actually codes, uh, they're going to tell you that that's not happening no time soon. And yeah, that's that's it. I mean, it's too complicated. Uh, there's a really good book that I recommend to everybody read. Uh, the name of this book is called On Intelligence. O N Intelligence. Who wrote the book is a he actually invented the Palm Pilot. He's a neuroscientist and a computer scientist, so he understands how the brain works and he understands how computers work. Uh, and he's one of the smartest people that <laughs> has ever. Brought On intelligence. Yeah. yeah, and so his book, he actually he destroys AI in this book. He totally decimates the concept. Uh-huh. Uh But he says that in, in smaller increments, like AI can do one or two things. Mo- mainly one thing there's not going to be some all omnipresent kind of uh omnis um what do you call it Om- omniscient Om- yeah whatever whatever yeah word. autonomous yeah yeah whatever yeah, it is. yeah all that yeah. stuff the autonomous vehicles ain't happening either i'm going to crush that that's not going to happen either uh and what are those what are those uh waymo cars i see driving around in mountain view then yeah it's not it's not going to happen like massive scale no no not going to happen it's going to be more like a like a guided system thing rather than just uh, the, the cars taking over and doing the, doing the whole thing. It's going to it's going to have to be super regulated and guided. I think that if you could, like we're in Austin, Austin has a ton of those kind of cars driving mm-hmm. and stuff too. Yeah. So so the problem is, I think it will require a whole different infrastructure nationwide for those cars to be relevant. They would have to have their own private lanes. I'm thinking, what I'm thinking here is just pure insurance and liability. That's the problem why it's not going to happen. I mean, the technology could be built, but if you think about it, they're not going to let those cars drive on the road with regular humans. Can you imagine? I mean, there's already been a couple incidents, and I'm not even worried about those incidents, by the way. I think the technology could be safe. But if it happens one time to somebody and their family member is hurt by Google or some other company, Waymo or whoever, the lawsuits are going to be crazy, bro. That's why I think that it, it's the legal threat in the USA, at least. But I, I can imagine somewhere like in China or something where they can they just pop infrastructure up like that. It's, it's probably going to be huge over there. But in the States, I don't think it's going to be huge. Yeah, I agree with you that there's huge liability hurdles. But, uh, but you know, when I see that there's, you know, one or two accidents where they've killed a pedestrian, it makes me think how many accidents were avoided because of autonomous technology. How do you even measure that? Dude, I'm 100% on board with technology. 100%. I think we, we can build the technology. I think it's going to be safer. There's a lot of drivers that suck, that need, shouldn't be driving. 100% on board with that. But in our country, the way our country works, our country is a capitalist and I'm going to sue you, country. That's how we run. Bro, we still don't, we're not even on a metric system yet, bro. Yeah, so, like, when we can do stuff like that, when we convert to what everybody else is using, I believe it's going to happen in the States. But, like, and also, like, in Austin, we have, like, a, the, one of the worst traffic nightmares going. Austin is one of the fastest growing cities, and we don't have the infrastructure to, to keep it up. Um yeah, but I think the technology could could work, but I think that because of the legal ramifications, it's not going to happen. Cool, man. This has been great. I, I've I've really enjoyed this. Thanks so much. Before we leave here, let's let's plug uh, everything we need to plug. If people want to get the book Tribe of Hackers, how do they do that? So you can go to Amazon dot com. So uh, if you go to Amazon, you can you can type in Tribe of Hackers in a Kindle version. And a paperback version is available there. You can also get the book for free as a pre- free PDF download. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I want to do is I believe information wants to be free. I'm like a hacker for real, for real. 
So we we released the free PDF of the book as well. And and the proceeds go to charity, right? Yep. Uh, and, and what's the charity? Uh, we have several charities. Uh, they're all listed in the book. One of the charities, I, I mean, my my charity. Each one of my team members gets to pick a charity. Sickle Cell Disease Association. Sickle Cell Disease, Disease Association. Yeah, yeah, because my my sister passed away with sickle cell. So, uh, and that's actually something that that uh, they're making progress on. But uh, yeah, so all kind of charities. That's great. And then uh, your work with Threat Care. Where, yeah. How can people find out about Threat Care? Okay, cool. So ThreatCare.com is our, is our website. Uh, we do breach and attack simulations and automated penetration testing. So you can go there. We're trying to make it super easy for any organization to test out their network security. And if people want to stalk you on Twitter, your Twitter handle is? It's Marcus J. Carey. Make sure you put the J in there. Marcus Carey is a uh, Kentucky GOP advocate. That's kind of not you. A wee bit different. Yeah. All right. So that's Marcus J. Carey on Twitter. Awesome. Thanks, Marcus. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Vince in the Bay podcast. Once again, I would like to thank Marcus Carey, my guest, for taking time to speak with me. You can find more information about this and past episodes at vinceinthebay.com. And you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Podbean, or pretty much whatever platform you use to subscribe to podcasts. And hit me up on Twitter. It's twitter.com slash Vince in the Bay. Until next time, ciao.